Talk about sales and selling. The biggest thing, like people hear it, it's like this antiquated notion of like, you know, manipulating people into buying something they truly don't want, need, or desire, um, tricking people into buying more than they need. You know, that's typically what I thought sales was until I started to actually study it. And, and frankly, sales, by definition, I, my definition, is the quickest, quickest way between a problem and a solution. And there's no, way to, there's no better way to put it than that. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. 20 Minute Leaders is a proud supporter of Make-A-Wish Israel and tech to peace and is in proud collaboration with Secret Chord Ventures, J Ventures, Riverside FM, Fusion VC, Birthright Excel, J Impact, Leap, Google for Startups, and Hippo, and in media partnership with CTEC. Hello, hello, and welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Today, we're going to be talking about chiropractors, but from a different lens. Meet Dr. Daniel Bay, the CEO of Close for Cairo, a provocative and enterprising business consulting company from an unlikely industry, chiropractic. He is an author, speaker, and thought leader on the subjects of sales and marketing in the modern world and has changed the antiquated notions most have about the subject. He has tackled the dilemma business owners struggle with when it comes to building a business at the expense of altruism and vice versa. Although he serves the chiropractic industry exclusively, his lessons cross all boundaries and are sought by many other businesses and organizations. Be warned, however, Dr. Dan's style is quick and straight from the hip. His level of candor in his interviews, speaking engagements, and broadcasts usually leave his listeners wondering what he will say next while gritting teeth. He holds no punches and does not sugarcoat anything. Reluctantly, he has been asked to tone it down, but has declined. And he is a 2000 USA National Silver Medalist in fencing. I love the setup that you have, and uh, and uh, I, we're gonna we're gonna have a really interesting conversation, not just about business and about entrepreneurship and about sales, uh, or about the industry that you're in, which is uh, definitely non not not the conventional industries that that I get to interview on this show, uh, and in your own personal journey is uh, it's pretty fascinating one on its own, and I'd love to start off the episode. Both, both by understanding you a little bit better and who you are, uh, and I, and I want to take it all the way around 2000. Uh, uh, you know, you're an athlete, also not a traditional mainstream athlete. Tell me a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, that kind of feeds into how I got into my own industry. And so um, uh, in high school, I was a uh, a fencer. So, um, and in my bio, I usually say that this certainly does not help my social life. Yeah. And um, but I got really good at it at a, at a pretty young age and I got recruited uh, to play a fence in college. And I fenced in college, <coughs> excuse me, fenced in nice. college. And then um, at my junior year or my senior year in college, um, I was the silver medalist, medalist at the 2000 US Nationals. So that's my claim to fame. Uh, but before that, if you back it up, um, the only reason I got to that level uh, of competition was because uh, I got an injury that man, I didn't fall. I had no car accidents, nothing. I just had a, this injury in my my in my pelvis and my lower back. And I was in school at Boston University. And you probably already know for the folks who are listening to this in North America, uh, Boston is like the medical mecca. They're the smartest people in the world in terms of healthcare all live and reside in the Boston area. And I probably visited about six or seven other uh, healthcare professionals, uh, orthopedic surgeons, um, X, Y, and Z, and no one could really figure out my problem. And uh, ultimately, I was left really in a really bad place. Um, I was very depressed. I couldn't do what I loved, and anyone who's been in that position probably understand. And then I stumbled onto a chiropractor um, online at Starbucks, ordering a drink. And the only thing that made me happy at the time was a frappuccino. So I went to get hobbled over to the Starbucks. I got a Frappuccino and the guy in back of me started asking me questions about why I'm, you know, 19 years old and I'm limping. Long story short, he invited me into his office. He worked on me and it was literally probably one of the few miraculous moments in my life because you got to understand I've been suffering with this problem for over like two months and in college at two months to make 
the lineup and also be ready and not lose my scholarship. There was a lot riding on it. It was forever. And the fact that he took me for one week and I was back with my team practicing, uh, preparing for nationals um, was the closest That's thing to the Oracle that I experienced. So, yeah. And so obviously that's, that incited a whole nother career change. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what is this thing? And prior to that, it's like chiropractic. What the heck is that? This is like witchcraft, like people, what? I don't understand. Like, how does this whole thing work? And so that um, was an incredibly curious time in my life. And then, of course, uh, I ended up uh, going to chiropractic school and the rest is history. <laughs> so well, what do you identify now talking from, you know, a business entrepreneurial uh, landscape? You're looking now at, at the, you know, the market. What are the different issues that you're noticing? And obviously this is going to, you know, feed into what, what you're doing at Close for Cairo. Close for Cairo. What, 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 what's happening here? Why were you in such a, in, in a difficult state where obviously you're, you're looking for help and help is right, literally next to you and you don't necessarily know to ask for it yourself? Yeah. So, um, that, you know, that was interesting because the conversation I had with Dr. Leader, and I'll just, I, I'll never forget him, was a conversation I had with him, not about the service or the product of chiropractic. And he could have been selling, I don't know, a, a pill. He could, he could have really been representing anything. But the reason that I, in my state, really connected with him was because he identified with one of my deepest wants, needs, and desires in that particular moment. So fast forward, I became a chiropractor, I started practicing, and it was a very another depressing moment in my life. <laughs> it's such a downer. It gets better, I promise. And the reason it was so bad is because when I graduated school, I was so enthusiastic about sharing this stuff that I have learned. And, and, and I just, all I really wanted to do was help other people experience what I experienced as a young man. But when I got into the practice, what I realized is that I was getting relentless no's. I, the rejection was overwhelming, Michael. I mean, I couldn't understand it. How could people say no to this thing that is so awesome, okay, that I know how to del deliver and I'm enthusiastic wow. about it? How could these people be saying no all day long? And so the, the challenge there was, is, this, is that for some reason, the people that I'm explaining this to, the people that I want to experience what I have to offer are saying no. And I couldn't understand why that was. And it wasn't because of the product or the service, because there's other uh, colleagues that were crushing it. But me, I'm sitting in an empty office. I can't feed my family. I can't, I remember I couldn't even afford, I lived in New York City at the time, couldn't even afford a bus fare at times because I was so broke. I was so enthusiastic. And and that was another very depressing time in my life because at that point, I thought about leaving the career because I couldn't make a living. So that was the challenge until I realized the biggest problem I had, Michael, at that point wasn't the fact that I wasn't good at what I did, technically. It was the fact that I could not sell this thing. And when yeah. I talk about sales and selling, the biggest thing like people hear, it, it's like this antiquated notion of like, you know, manipulating people into buying something they truly don't want, need, or desire, um, tricking people into buying more than they need. You know, that's typically what I thought sales was until I started to actually study it. And, and frankly, sales, by definition, I, my definition, is the quickest, quickest way between a problem and a solution. And there's no way to, there's no better way to put it than that. So what, what is this, what is the experience that you've had as you're thinking through taking People who are naturally are, you know, they're, you know, you're, you're providing a gift, your service is a gift to somebody else in need. You know, it's a, it's, it's not the most trivial thing to sell and you're taking them through a process of learning how to sell it, which is almost, I think it, it feels like in terms of the, the way the industry has shaped itself is sort of, you know, counter to the actual doing, right? I mean, there's some perception that selling means that you're not necessarily the one doing you know, the actual service, you're just sort of a liaison, but here you're saying this is a critical, a critical piece of it. How, how, you know, put this puzzle together for me because I feel like it's coming together and I really want to get it. Yeah. So that's a great point, Michael, because in traditional sales professionals, you're a liaison, you're right, uh, between uh, the customer and the fulfillment side, right? So how many times have we <laughs> talked to a salesperson and they, they close and they, they, um, they get our business and then we never see them again because now we're with a different company or, or department for them to fulfill 
that particular product or service, right? <clears throat> For most entrepreneurs though, uh, and me included, especially in healthcare or in, in the service industry, you are the salesperson and you are also the fulfiller of that particular product and service. You're the, you're the same people, you're the same person. So that presents a challenge. And I'll tell you why, Michael, because we are almost too invested in our product and service where we take things way too personally, where we lose objectivity. And because of that, we lose perspective. Now, one of the things that we teach all of our clients, and this, this crosses all boundaries. I don't care if you're selling healthcare or, or, you know, a, 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 a drone for kids or it doesn't really matter. What all people, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is that because we're so invested personally in what we're doing is that we lose perspective of our prospect. So we always say, always be in the perspective of your prospect. And if you're too worried about your own stuff and you're too worried about being rejected, you're too worried about, you know, making you look yourself look so good and padding your resume and making yourself look so attractive that it never leaves in a bandwidth for you to really understand what the other person truly wants, needs, and desires. And if you, if you don't have that perspective, I'm sorry, you don't have a chance, okay, ever in getting that other person to see you as a solution to their problem or for the other yeah. person to actually want what you have to offer. So how much of the the sales that or the techniques, the strategies for making it work, how much of it is is tailored to chiropractors versus how much of it is more general, you know, skill sets that would be relevant and could be could be, you know, associated or transitioned to any any industry or any product? That's a great question. In the beginning, Michael, I thought it was only specific to my industry because I didn't know anything else. Then I come to find out, and we've been doing this for over 12 years, um, we come to find out that the majority of what we're talking about uh, shares the same concepts as en- selling any other product or service worldwide, whether it be a product or service or anything in between. So I'm going to say 90% of what we're talking about are skills that can be used in any other industry because I learned it from other industries because, you know, one of the things that I had a problem with it was in my industry, there was no one teaching it because the whole entire industry was so, I guess, infantile in terms of their, their business acumen where they never talked about sales because sales was a bad thing. So that's how I grew up in this. So I couldn't find it inside my own industry. So I had to go elsewhere. So where did I look? I looked at the top, you know, when you think about people who know how to sell, we're talking real estate, we're talking automobile, we're talking finan- uh, uh, financial instruments, we're talking all those other things, uh, pharmaceutical sales, pharmaceutical equipment sales. So I had to go to those industries to understand how this whole thing works. And we can talk through some of the basic strategies and, and, and some of, and once we get through it, you're going to be like, man, that is so common sense. Yes, it is. This thing called selling is so simple. And unfortunately, we overcomplicate this. And anytime you overcomplicate selling, it's like overcomplicating a first date. You know what I'm saying? Like in a first date, if you talk too much, you're probably not going to get a second date, right, Michael? If you talk about yourself too much, you're not going to get a second date. What is the best way to ensure a second date? As, you know, from the male perspective, I can, I can only speak from that. It's number one, shut up. Stop, stop talking. Number two, be inquisitive, be curious. And number three, ask the appropriate questions that allows the other person to open up to you more than they would open up to anybody else. And that's the anatomy of the initial interaction in any sales conversation. I don't care what industry you're in. Interesting. Interesting. I like that. I like that very much. How have you fine-tuned your own business over, t- tell me about the growth of Close for Cairo as, as you grow it yourself, because, you know, both, both with the, you know, with the nature of the show, you know, the, I'm really curious to hear about how your, your personal journey, journey evolved with this company and how you've grown with your understandings. You've built your thesis around what product you're personally offering. It sounds like you've had quite a few step functions in your own journey. Tell me a little bit about the growth of Close for Cairo and, and what this company is all about. Sure. So, um, it, you know, like, like any 
business venture, I think we can all agree it evolves over time. In the beginning, it was just a way for me to share knowledge that other, my colleagues did not have. So it was very casual and we used to teach them, this is what you do, this is how you do it. And um, one of the things that I realized over the course of the last 10, 12 years is that, um, especially in entrepreneurialism and, and you know, um, uh, you know, self-development, personal development, there's a lot of just lip service. There's a, and I hate to say it this way, like, you know, when you go on Facebook or Instagram, you know, you see those little posts with the little quotes on there and they all sound good, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I got to do that. Or, oh yeah, that sounds really good. And it's, and it ends there, you know, it just inspires you to no end. There's no purpose in this inspiration. There's no purpose in this positive mental attitude or, or being, being, you know, um, uh, having a, uh, a a good mental game, and this is the analogy I want to give. And if you're a, if you're a golfer, let's say, um, I don't care how many Instagram posts that you read about having positive mental attitude, or how many books you read on how to be better with your attitude. If you don't have the fundamentals of the game of golf, you will never, ever, ever tee it up at the U.S. Open or at the Masters. Like. The odds are infinitesimally, imp- it's, it, it's practically impossible for me and you to tee it up at the Masters with world-class golfers just by thinking positively. <laughs> and in my profession, like that's been rampant. It's like, oh, everything's going to be fine if you just are positive. And that drove me nuts. I wanted to bang my head against the mic every time I hear that because people who are saying that are lacking the fundamental skills that you need in terms of sales and business. And I don't care how positive you are, you're never going to get there. And so what we did was in terms of our teaching is, listen, I, th- th- we got to start somewhere. And what we got, we have to do is we have to teach a framework. And, and this is important because, Michael, listen, sales has always been esoteric. It's always been a little bit like, you know, oh, this is kind of how you do it. There was never a formulated structure that was dedicated to a particular industry. So what we did was we took all of the teachings that we've learned from other industries and adapted it to the chiropractic industry. What that means is this is the first question you ask. This is how you ask it. These are the, these are the, the possible responses you'll get. And this is how you re- respond. Now that seems very scripted and it's very... Um, you know, in a box. But I got to tell you something. If you don't know the fundamentals of the fundamentals of the fundamentals, you will never ever reach the art level that you will in anything that you do. Okay, let's take golf, for example. Yeah, grip, stance, ball position, all fundamentals, boring, scripted. Every person who learns how to play golf learns those fundamentals. You want to learn how to play the piano. You do scales, you do chords, you learn the notes, you understand. Everyone who's learned piano a certain classical way learned it the same way. What separates the person that is actually in Carnegie Hall playing piano and the person that's in their room playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? What's the difference? The biggest difference is the fact that the person who is making this art, who is making them their own, knows the fundamentals so inside out, so rock solid that now they put themselves into it and they actually express that thing as art, as opposed to the person who can't even play a scale that wants to play at Carnegie Hall. So that's what we learned over the years. It's like, we got to start with the fundamentals of the fundamentals and the fundamentals. And it's boring sometimes. I get it. But wow. if we can make it fun to, f- to learn the fundamentals, then that's the first step. You feel me? Completely. I mean, I, I, mean, I just love that analogy. I mean, I... I... <laughs> I don't think I've ever thought of it that way, but it's uh, it, it's it's quite remarkable because it's, it's definitely true. I mean, you're looking at the way that you're you're practicing, and I play saxophone and I play tennis, and I'm looking at the way that I started out, and I was doing the most boring mm-hmm. things for the first three four years, boring. right? And I'm looking at the way that I'm the way that I'm looking at you know the the transitions that I've made as a as a player as an athlete to to bringing my own creativity to uh, to bringing my own self on the court and on the stage the only way that i'm able to do that is through the confidence both both the confidence that i gained learning the the fundamentals but also understanding the rules of the game so that i can engage with the game in a meaningful way and adapt as needed uh, and it's pretty and, and, and bend pretty, the rules when you need to right right 
yeah, and uh, completely, yes. completely. Um, that that's really that's really amazing. And, I, and Daniel, I really want to thank you for for coming on and for sharing these, uh, you know, these insights with me. And um, and I uh, really, really did love the conversation. And that that this last note is definitely going to leave me leave me hanging for a while, uh, thinking about not just not just about the chiropractor, about my my own self, but you know everything that I also do, you know, in running a company and in building products. I mean, if I think this. This idea spans far beyond sales or what I do. It's, it's really sort of this, an understanding that a lot of things you have to get the fundamentals right in order to become, you know, a, a key player in it. Absolutely. Wonderful. Daniel, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Michael, it was my pleasure uh, for being on here with you. Good luck with everything that you're doing in the future. Appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Mm-hmm.